I'm Rob Fisher. I'm a member of the faculty here at the Mandel School and direct our master's program in, in nonprofit organizations. Uh, welcome to our first installment in our 2020 nonprofit management leadership series. It's good to have you all here tonight. Um, just a couple couple items of business. Um, I want to extend a greeting on behalf of Dean Gilmore, who couldn't be here this evening. Um, I also want to invite you to pick up one of these cards to make sure that you come back in March and April for our next two installments uh, in March on the Art of Fundraising on March 25th, and then on April 30th on Transformational uh, Giving. Um, so please uh, plan to come back for those. It'll be in the same space. Um, I'm really delighted uh, to be able to have this session tonight. I think this is an important topic for us in, in the social sector and in, in social work and human services generally for us to think about it. And I'm just excited that uh, we have our guests tonight to help us kind of navigate this uh, topic of social enterprise. As a layperson, as I thought about this topic, you know, I looked for some definitions and uh, the ones I found uh, offered a couple of principles. One is that the or an organization is engaged in some commercial activity that provides revenue um, as part of its work. And secondly, that the common good is a, is a primary purpose, literally kind of baked into to the work. But having said that, particularly as someone who works closely with a lot of nonprofits, I'm thinking of this as, as two ends of a spectrum. Nonprofits doing things that are more like businesses and businesses doing things that are more like traditional nonprofits. What I'm excited about is our guests are gonna help us think through that continuum and what is probably a more complicated reality on the ground. So let me introduce our two guests. Um, first, you'll be hearing from Dennis Young. And uh, Dennis is a professor emeritus from uh, Georgia State University uh, and is also currently a distinguished visiting professor here at the Mandel School. Now, when he was at Georgia State, he was a professor of public management at the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies uh, and directed the nonprofit studies program uh, there and held the Ramsey Chair in Private Enterprise. But we think he only got that job because he'd been here at the Mandel School before that. Uh, from 1988 to 96, he was the director of the Mandel Center for, uh, for Nonprofit Organizations and was the Mandel Professor of Nonprofit Management uh, here at the Mandel School. He's probably the only person I know that's created and launched two journals himself. Uh, one, Nonprofit Management and Leadership, which is one of the, the, the leading journals in the field uh, currently. And also he uh, started an, another journal called Nonprofit Policy Forum, which he currently serves as the editor of. Um, and he may mention something about that. Uh, he's also a past president of the Association for Research on Nonprofit Organizations and Voluntary Action, our NOVA, which is a terrible acronym, but it's a long name. Uh, he's written many books, and I'd encourage you to, to look at that. I pulled out one from my library, which he wrote when I was in high school. <laughs> from 1983, if not for profit, for what? Uh, which is a collector's item these days, because it's out of, out of pr it's been reissued in. And available online, <laughs> open access. Open, open access now. <laughs> But tonight he's going to be talking, he has six or seven other books uh, that he's authored or co-authored. Tonight he'll be talking about uh, his book, from his book, The Social Enterprise Zoo. Um, and he'll give you the, the full lowdown on that. And then following Dennis, uh, we're going to welcome Terry Davis, uh, who's here. Uh, Terry is the president and CEO of Our Lady of the Wayside, and he's been in that position since 1993. What what, what is clear from his leadership of that organization is a dramatic growth uh, as a nonprofit from uh, something like, uh, and he'll tell you about their work, but uh, they currently have over 800 employees, and I'm not sure what the number was when you came on, but I know it was very, very small. Um, Terry uh, has had a, a long career at this organization, but what I like about him is he grew up in Cleveland, he attended Cleveland Public Schools. Uh, he has uh, 
an associate's uh, degree from Miami-Dade South College and his BA in Urban Studies from Cleveland State. He's also held a number of positions uh, in direct service and, and leadership in nonprofits uh, as a consultant, as a youth counselor, behavior specialist, uh, on and on, group home administrator. So he's gonna talk about uh, how social enterprise has uh, been a key feature of his work at Our Lady of the Wayside. So we're gonna start with Dennis. I'm gonna invite him up. We'll have uh, Dennis talk, uh, then Terry, then we'll have Q&A, and, &A, and uh, we'll be, you can certainly ask questions along the way, but please keep in mind we wanna uh, let me get to you with the microphone so that our folks who are watching the live stream and will watch the tape later will know what your question was. And so with that, let's welcome Dennis Young. Thank you, Rob. Um, I'm told that, that my volume is being uh, regulated remotely, so I feel like a person, but also a little like a robot. As long as you can hear, just uh, we're OK. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. I uh, appreciate this, this opportunity. And we want to talk about uh, a topic uh, that uh, Rob has introduced. I thought he was going to give my lecture for a second, but <laughs> was, uh, there's some analytical content to his introductory remarks. Um, and you know, we we realized that the only thing standing between uh, us now and you're getting to the uh, political debate tonight uh, is is this lecture. So we're going to try to make this, I think, as exciting as that's going to be. Okay. Let's start out by asking, Terry, is it really a good thing that you get so much money from billionaires? <laughs> That's the question you're going to hear. Yeah. Yeah, yes, it is. Yes, it is. OK, well, we'll talk, we'll, we'll talk to Bernie about that. Um, so uh, I want to get a sense of uh, who we are in, in the room here. Uh, let's see, this just goes up or down? down. OK. Uh, that's me. Uh, because I want to know why do you want to know about social enterprise? Um, how many managers are here? People who, who actually are managing a, a nonprofit. There you go. I mean, you might want to know about social enterprise from a management point of view. Is this something that uh, can help me out in terms of uh, making my organization more effective in achieving its mission and gathering the resources for it? Um, how many people are on boards of directors here, or trustees? OK. Well, you're, you're concerned about things like having a, you know, a solid enough uh, foundation for your organization in terms of resources. You're concerned about uh, achieving your mission. Is social enterprise something that can, uh, can help you in that respect? Um, any investors here? We have such a thing now as social investors, okay? People who are trying to find places to invest their, their resources, their funds, um, so that uh, they not only get a reasonable financial return, but they might you know, uh, be concerned about making a social impact. <laughs> so you might be interested if you were an investor, this could be a topic of interest uh, to you. How many people think of themselves as entrepreneurs? There we go. That's that's a that's a pretty good. So one of the, um, you know, one of the things that you need to do uh, as an entrepreneur, if you if you have a a, a venture or a project uh, or, or a cause that you want to pursue, you need to decide what's what's the organizational uh, vehicle and the structure <clears throat> that is best going to allow uh, allow us to achieve that particular mission. Um, how many people here are researchers? Yeah, well, I, I, knew, uh, I knew I had at least one. <laughs> um, this, this is a particularly interesting topic from a, from a research point of view. I mean, uh, and I won't go into that extensively now, except to say if you're going to research something, you've got to be able to define it, and you've got to be able to count it. And then you start from there to, to analyze. Uh, what it is and its impact and so forth. And social enterprise uh, is, is at a stage where we don't, we don't have clarity on that. And that's one of the things that we need to talk about. That's why we're going to be talking about 
you know, Rob offered a definition, and it's, um, you know, it's in the general, the right general direction, but, but we have no agreement um, on, on what a social enterprise is. And so that's really interesting from a, from a research uh, point of view. And it's very different, if I can digress slightly, because, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm lucky enough to be old enough to remember the beginning of the field of nonprofit studies, right? 30, 40 years ago, there was no such field, and we were creating the field. And there wasn't, there wasn't that much, uh, you know, uh, controversy about what it is we're studying. I mean, nonprofit organizations have definitions. They have an economic def definition, they have a legal definition, <clears throat> and so forth. Uh, but social enterprise uh, is not at that stage. So we, we talk about social enterprise, but sometimes, you know, one person talking about it means something very different from what, what another person uh, means when they're talking about it. Uh, students, okay. All right, well, uh, this is a, a topic of interest to you because if you take my class and you want to get an A, you need to know what social enterprise is, so your motivation is very clear, okay? Um, all right, so um, what, what, what is your sense of, well, let me, let me skip the, the, the second bullet, because I, I, I've got a limited amount of time and we want to get into this, but are you familiar with things out there that you would call social enterprises? What, what are some examples that you think about in terms of social enterprises? Anybody? Yeah, sir? Maybe Tom Shoes. <laughs> okay, Tom Shoes, for-profit company, right? But what does it do? It, well, you probably know better, better than I, but when you, know, when you purchase from Tom Shoes, Tom Shoes it also gives shoes to people that require it without, without paying for it. So it's a social enterprise. It's a for-profit. Um, so it's different from nonprofit, maybe? What else uh, do you think about in terms of social enterprises? Anybody familiar with? Yeah, sure. Um, so enterprise where um, disadvantaged people do the work and they get something back for that. So you employ, let's say, women in villages to mm -hmm. leave something and mm -hmm. sell that in the Yeah, exactly. So we have lots of examples of that. We used to. Um, the term isn't used anymore, but we used to call them like sheltered workshops or thing, uh, just the little enterprises that are specifically employing um, people that need to um, uh, develop in terms of their uh, ability to support themselves and, and they're like little businesses, okay? So that's, those are two, two examples that would fall under the general umbrella of what people are, you know, referring to when they talk about social enterprise. But is that it? I mean, is that uh, any other kinds of examples? Um, the, the point I'm going to make, who? Yeah, oh. What about Edwin's? He thinks, he, he, Edwin's, yeah, that's on my list. Absolutely. Uh, anybody know about Edwin's? It's got food that is as good as that. It's up on Shaker Square. It's a great French restaurant. And what's so special about it? All of the serves are previous Yeah, all of the, just about all the employees have been previously involved in the criminal justice system, right? And it's, it's both a, uh, a restaurant and it's, and it's a, a, an institute to teach people the various aspects of uh, uh, culinary operations and to move people that you know, were in trouble with the criminal justice system into mainstream uh, employment and, uh, and long-term stability. So I recommend Ed, Edwin's. Um, and, but I'm getting to a, the, the point that there are, there's just a really wide variety of things that we're familiar with that we uh, are calling, often calling social enterprises. So let me see, here's my, here's, here's a list. It's just a list of some things that I'm familiar with. Um, I've categorized it in two different ways. Well, 
one way here, sometimes we're, we're talking about a whole organization like Edwin's, okay, social enterprise, uh, or Better World Books. And uh, when we talk about organizations, um, it turns out in this list, we've got nonprofits, we've got for-profits, we've got public-private nonprofit partnerships, um, just about everything you could think about in terms of different legal uh, arrangements. Uh, and some, but sometimes people talk about social enterprise as part of another organization, as a, as a kind of program or a, a strategy um, that uh, supplements the, uh, the other services of an organization. So everybody's sort of familiar with the fact that Goodwill Industries has thrift shops, museums have gift shops, um, you're familiar with perhaps Habitat for Humanity Restore, and Terry will probably talk about a little bit about his car donation program. Um, these are these are all things that kind of, as Rob mentioned, kind of you know uh, combine um, a, a revenue generating aspect, um, operating successfully in the marketplace with a social a social impact. So. Um, you know, kind of all these things are presumably within the general rubric of social enterprise, and when researchers got together to try to figure out how best to define and characterize it, it became a, an interesting and, and difficult uh, problem. So let's, um, let's see how we're gonna deal with that. Um, I'm, I'm gonna skip a lot of these examples because we've talked about them. That's a for-profit, Bedworld Books. Um, that's a for-profit, a, a non-profit charity attached to a for-profit uh, uh, team. Um, this is, uh, they will have access to these slides, right? Yeah. Okay, so you can, you can look at this, but these are the examples. I just, uh, um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but we can come back to it. The point is, um, there's really no single satisfactory legal or organizational definition of a social enterprise. It's a diverse phenomenon that comes in many different forms, and it is kind of held together by this common thread of it's got to, it's got to have both a social purpose and a, and a market success kind of aspect to it. And so, um, just as another little bit of history, you know, you go as, a, as an academic, as a researcher, you go to these professional meetings, everybody's, you know, trying to figure things out. And uh, I, I, I to think of one, um, one meeting in particular, I think it was, uh, it wasn't, it might have been in, in Spain. And the Europeans are sitting around and they're saying, here's my definition of a social enterprise and it's got all these characteristics. And the Americans are saying, no, it doesn't quite fit what we're talking about, you know. Um, and a number of us kind of looked, looked at each other and we said, you know, this is, this is kind of a zoo. You know, and uh, our European friends at first thought it was a, a little bit of an insult, but, but actually that turns out to be a very uh, interesting metaphor because I think it's important to recognize that there is no one form of social enterprise. Um, there's a way of looking at the collection as, as, common, as kind of a, uh, an important uh, uh, mode of, of uh, activity um, but if we, if we try to s sort of hammer a very detailed uh, definition and specification of this is, and this is the problem that I had with some of my European friends at that time, this is the ideal type of social enterprise. This is what it should look like. And I think we have to kind of get over that and realize that what we're talking about is many different uh, manifestations um, that may fit particular missions and particular uh, circumstances, fields of service, even localities or nation, uh, national context um, differently. And it's really more a question of, you know, what, what, does, it, what does it make uh, sense to, uh, what kind of design makes sense in a particular circumstance. So that's why we uh, kind of adopted the uh, the metaphor of the social enterprise zoo, and eventually some colleagues of mine and I got around to writing a book called What Do You Think? The Social Enterprise Zoo, uh, which, which uh, Rob mentioned. 
And I hope you'll take a look at that. Um, so, gee, half, I'm halfway through and here's my plan. <laughs> Um, I want to give, because the other half of this topic was social enterprise and the nonprofit sector. So, wait a minute, what do they have to do with one another? Uh, and, and, the, and the key there is why are people in the nonprofit sector, why do you guys want to know about this? You know, what's, what's, the, uh, what's the connection, what's the motivation for people associated with the nonprofit sector to want to at least understand, if not engage, social enterprise? And, um, then, then I want to present a little bit about this idea of the zoo and, and what that looks like and how we apply it to social enterprise. <clears throat> and uh, maybe a discussion of how that, um, you know, that metaphor helps us think through a variety of issues that are of interest to nonprofit managers, leaders, and uh, researchers, students, and others. So, about the nonprofit sector, <laughs> I finally get around to that, right? Um, <clears throat> we know that nonprofits uh, operate in very different fields. This is stuff that I probably don't have to tell most of you, but, but lots of different missions and different kinds of services. Um, but a very substantial part of the United States economy, more than two million formal organizations, over 5% of the gross domestic product, 11% of the paid employment, that's if you don't count volunteers, which you should, and they spend something like $2 trillion and have $5 trillion in assets. So this is, this is an important sector, <clears throat> and one of the things that I want you to think about is if this is so substantial and so you know, uh, uh, grounded and established, why are people worried about something called social enterprise? Um, we know that nonprofits operate in a variety of ways, and this gives us a little bit of a hint because um, we know that non, you know, way back when the field was being established, some folks, in fact, there's still an organization that decided that this was the independent sector. But in fact, uh, nonprofits, as we know, are integrally connected with the business sector, integrally connected with government. Um, very few nonprofits are just sort of by themselves. So it really shouldn't surprise us if there are activities, even within nonprofit sector, that are market oriented, right? And one of the questions I think we have to ask ourselves about social enterprise is, well, haven't we been doing that all along? And isn't that part of you know, what we're talking about here, maybe we're talking about an expanded version of what's been going on uh, for a long time. But we know that, you know, nonprofits contract with government for service delivery. We know that nonprofits supply, provide uh, services on their own when, when government is, uh, is inadequate. You know, we get private schools to supplement public schools and sort of thing. And then there are some things that government doesn't do that uh, is of a collective nature, and the nonprofit sector gets involved. Not too many government churches, at least in this country. And, uh, and you can think of some other examples. So you know, you know all of this. This is an interesting Venn diagram that's borrowed from a book called The Social Economy of, uh, <clears throat> of the United States. Anybody here that's taken my course here knows the book because I use it as a as a, as a text, and, and again, it shows that nonprofits are involved in a variety of ways. Sometimes they, you know, where it's a civil society, sometimes they, you know, just sort of operate on their own without too much connection, but in other cases, they're pretty much like social economy businesses, and, and uh, or they operate in, uh, with close, closely to government, heavily government funded, or sometimes you get all three sectors involved in things like local economic development. And um, so, you know, again, it shouldn't surprise us that nonprofits are interested in this phenomenon of social enterprise because they've kind of always been connected with, uh, with the business and, and other sectors. <clears throat> so, given all that, and I, you know, I've tried to sort of paint a quick picture of hey, we've got a very substantial, vibrant nonprofit sector in, in this country and around the world, in fact. Um, and it's been that way for a while. So um, why all of this interest in social enterprise? Um, 
you know, what, 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 is, what is pushing people to think that perhaps the nonprofit sector that we have isn't adequate for what we want it to do? Um, I, I, I'm sure you have some ideas on it. I'm, I'm just going to, uh, to give you, um, you know, a, a brief summary of some points that, that come out. We know that uh, the problems aren't going away uh, in, in all of those so, uh, social purpose areas. And we know that government has uh, not exactly, uh, in, in recent years, uh, been uh, coming forth with burgeoning uh, resources for social services and arts and all those good things. Um, so as government kind of levels and reduces its role, and, um, and philanthropy itself actually, even recently giving has, has gone down, but over the long term it's grown, but it hasn't grown that fast. So here we've got a sector that's faced with a lot of social demands and, and very constricted resources. And I think this is, this is one of the motivations that, that leads people to want to think about uh, social enterprise. Uh, and nonprofits uh, have certain restrictions. I mean, if they really want to expand, they can't do certain things. They can't go out like a business and, and, and sell, uh, sell stock, for example. Um, it, it, nonprofits are a very different sector. They're, they're not necessarily uh, filled with people that want to take over the world. They want to do their mission. They want to do it right. Uh, if they grow, they grow. And, uh, and, uh, but more, you know, many people are, are just uh, more concerned with achieving uh, what they're supposed to achieve. And uh, so it's hard to attract resources in, 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 in that environment sometimes. You know, you can't use the profit motive for, for investors. And you can't appeal to entrepreneurs to say, this is the way you, you're going to get rich. Although we have some students here, I had an earlier conversation that believe that they will enter the billionaire class once they get their degrees, but we'll, we'll see. You know, it's possible. Um, okay, well, this is, this is more both about the entrepreneurship, which is limited. I mean, we have this field now called social entrepreneurship, and it's very important, and it's also, you know, uh, the, the recognition of this phenomenon has grown along with the interest in social enterprise. Um, but it's limited in certain ways. You, you know, you, you, you can't uh, appeal directly to the, to the profit motive because nonprofits are, you know, restricted from directly distributing profits to people that control um, the organization. And nonprofits are regulated in ways that entrepreneurs aren't, uh, aren't always, um, you know, terribly uh, comfortable with. Um, I've, I've done more than one case study of, of, of people that have set up, uh, you know, for-profit social service agencies because they didn't want to work for, a, a set up and establish and work for an organization where the board could fire them even though they started the organization. That's something that can happen in the nonprofit sector, but not the for-profit sector if you're the owner. Um, Okay. Uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, nonprofits can involve, uh, engage social enterprises and become more entrepreneurial themselves. As some of the examples that I gave you, those were those were nonprofit. Many many of them were nonprofit. So back to the question. Okay, what what are we uh, what are we going to where are we going to start when we define what we mean in general about social enterprise? And I'll just throw this out because we've already kind of talked about it. Um, we can start with something very, very general, and don't even think about all the different forms out there. We want whatever we do, whether it's a, a particular venture or setting up a new organization, we want it to be economically viable. And that may mean operating in the marketplace, but we can be even more general than that and say, as long as you've got a good plan to get enough of all the different kinds of revenues that you can attract, you know, it could be. It could be donations, it could be volunteer time, it, it could be um, government contracts, it could be selling uh, services and goods. But the financially sustainable part is very important and the social impact is very important. <clears throat> those, those are the two legs of whatever it is that we're gonna define as a social enterprise, they have to have that. They have to have the ability to prosper 
in the marketplace generally defined, and they have to have a social impact, a positive social impact. And that gives us a clue in terms of, of how we can you know, think about this. Um, it sounds simple, but it, but it really uh, is complex, um, but it's broad enough to, to put boundaries around what is a social enterprise and what's not a social enterprise, perhaps. Uh, interestingly enough, this definition includes nonprofit organizations, right? Uh, like we said before, you know, maybe we've been doing it all along and we just didn't know what to call it. But nonprofits have to survive in the marketplace, right? They don't get any automatic subsidy. Um, they have to find ways of putting the resources together uh, from whatever sources. Um, many of them do operate in the marketplace uh, quite substantially. And, and they have, uh, you know, they don't qualify to be a nonprofit. They don't qualify for tax exemption and, and specific designations <clears throat> unless they do indeed have a social mission and a social impact. So traditional nonprofits fit this definition, but the definition is broader than that and can embrace a variety of forms in addition to what we're used to as conventional uh, nonprofit organizations. Okay, so that's where the zoo comes in, and there's the zoo, okay? So when we think of the zoo as a metaphor, okay, what about the zoo? Susan, we got, we got the expert here. She used to work for the Cleveland Zoo. She was a distinguished graduate of the MNO program, and she can probably tell me more about zoos than I can tell you, but what, you know, what are zoos? They have animals. They have animals in different habitats. Um, they have to feed the animals, so you have to think about sustaining these animals. They have ecologies, you know, which animals go with which animals and which ones don't. Um, they have life cycles, you know, different types of animals um, live for a certain period of time and, and others live longer or shorter. They have curators. Somebody decides what animals to bring into the zoo, right? It's like pieces of art. Okay, you know, I'm the tiger guy. I go out and get tigers. Uh, <clears throat> when we first started developing this metaphor, I was given some talks on it, and people would say, who's the zookeeper? And that one, that one was, was kind of a, a tough one for a while. You know, we'd say, well, the social entrepreneurs are the zookeepers. You know, they, they set this all up. But, but actually, uh, it's, it's whoever kind of sets the rules. And that's kind of what's happening these days. You know, we're getting different types of social enterprises, and somebody has to say what these things are and whether they fit certain definitions and can, you know, have to conform to certain policies or, uh, you know, need to follow certain regulations. That's what, that's what, um, that's what the government is all about. And so we need a zookeeper to say, okay, this is what we mean by social, uh, by, by uh, a social enterprise. And it has to have boundaries. You know, what's inside the zoo and what is inside, isn't inside the zoo. So I told you before, you know, a traditional nonprofit seems to fit that definition. But it doesn't have to. It's just that we have to figure that out. You know, we need some sort of a policy that says these things are inside the social enterprise zoo. This is what we want to call a social enterprise. And these things are outside, you know, uh, and the outside things could be, no, that's too much like a traditional business. We don't want to count that. Um, or this is just too much like a, a charitable nonprofit, and we don't want to count that. Uh, and it's an important question. It's certainly an important question for researchers because researchers want to be able to say, is this a growing phenomenon or not? Does it, does it differ between what's going on in Ohio, what's going on in Alabama, or what's going on in the United States versus, <clears throat> versus Europe? And when we set policies, who do they apply to? You know, we already have regulations that apply to nonprofits. We have regulations that apply to, to businesses. <clears throat> if we're going to do something like that for social enterprise, we kind of have to know who's in the zoo and who's not. So the, the zoo metaphor kind of brings all those issues together in terms of um, a paradigm that we can use to think about it. Um, okay, so that's what I just said. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so let's talk about the animals a little bit more. Um, so we know about nonprofits and we know about business, but it turns out that there are a whole variety of new forms, 
you know, coming into play. And, um, you know, actually new legal forms that uh, are, I think, roughly described well, I've got some more slides on this, but I may I should try to give you an, an overall sense. Roughly described as social businesses, okay? There are people, there are states, lots of people out there, lawyers for sure, trying to, um, you know, determine what is a social enterprise legally. And the, and the parameters that they, that, are, that they are dealing with um, you know, which could almost be thought of as a tweak of a business or a tweak of a nonprofit, are <clears throat> nonprofits are not allowed to distribute their, their profits to people that control, right? To owners. We don't have any owners. Okay. Businesses, sure. So we have, to, we have to say something about a social enterprise in terms of to what degree can, can they fit the definition of a social enterprise and distribute profits? Okay, and so we have these forms that you know are sort of limited profit distribution. That's one. That's one uh, parameter. Another parameter is what happens if an organization closes. What happens to the assets? Well, in a nonprofit, they have to go to another charitable cause, uh, usually in a similar similar field. Um, in a business, you know, you sell the business, it's it's gone, right? So, what kind of restrictions? do we want to put on locking up the assets for the general social mission? It's called an asset lock. Um, the Europeans, because they deal with cooperatives all the time, they want to insist that social enterprises should be governed democratically. Well, nonprofits don't fit that very well, but there are these forms of um, co social cooperative that, that uh, very much um, you know, kind of conform to what Europeans have in mind for social enterprise. So that enters the picture. How are they, how are they governed? And to what, what kind of priority are they giving to social purpose versus economic success? Um, and that's important, not only to sort of signal what an organization is going to do, but also to be able to protect the managers of those uh, organizations from their investors and from their um, board members who said, no, I signed up for this organization because you were going to maximize my profit. And now you're going off and you're spending all these funds on socially good things that are cutting into you know, what I thought I was going to get in terms of an investment return. So you have to have a legal. You know, if you want to attract investors and protect yourself from purely profit-making uh, investors, you have to have a legal structure that's going to allow you to say, "No, we told you that we told you in the first place that we are we are about social as well as financial returns." Okay, so that that also accounts for some of the differences in the different forms. And so we've got. Uh, I mean, this is just a short list, but we have things called called low profit, limited liability uh, corporations, uh, um, you know, uh, L3Cs for short. We have uh, other legal forms that are more like benefit corporations, just different types of legislation that states have come up with to, um, to indicate the degree to which they follow these different um, parameters. We have things called social cooperatives that are you know, more democratic kind. In England, we've got things called community interest companies, which look a lot like nonprofits, except they find a back door for bringing in private investors and giving them a limited return uh, for, for the funds that they, they provide, you know, trying to sort of tap into that uh, capital market that nonprofits are usually locked out of. So, you know, this is all happening now, and it's and it's interesting. And we're we're actually planning. I see Susan over here. We're we're we're, we're going we're planning a program uh, in May when uh, I'm hoping to have the world's expert on different legal forms and how they've been developing. A guy named uh, Cass Brewer, uh, who follows this thing very closely. And if I had time, I would click on this. But you should click on it because it gives you a map of the United States from 2009 to 2019. And as you go from year to year to year, you see the states being populated out with different forms of legislation that have come into being um, all along these lines. And you, know, you, you can just see that 
it's like a movie. You can almost see it grow in real time from almost nothing in 2009 to 2019, where almost every state has got some form of um, social purpose for profit entity that they are trying to uh, uh, engender uh, as, a, as their definition of a, of a social enterprise, or one, one definition of a new form of social enterprise. If we look at Europe, it's a little different. This is another interesting website. Um, and they have these two, three major types. Um, some are nonprofit organizations. They consider nonprofit organizations, interestingly enough, they consider nonprofit organizations, when I say they, I mean, there's a lot of countries over there, but I'm just sort of generalizing, uh, as a social enterprise because they're used to the government doing stuff. And so now, you know, if you move it out into a nonprofit organization, hey, you know, that's a social enterprise. We're, we're kind of used to thinking of nonprofits as. As, uh, as having been you know, well established and social enterprise being something else, but not the Europeans. They're thinking, okay, nonprofit organizations or a particular type of cooperative that has a social objective. Uh, and they're also getting into this notion of what they call share companies, for profit businesses that have a social objective as well. That's just to give you an idea of the just vast activity that's going on out there, uh, experimenting. Basically, we have an experiment going on in real time of different countries and different states um, trying to get these different for forms out there and seeing, seeing what works. Um, OK, I wanted to, uh, and I don't know how much I'm going to go into this, but I, I wanted to present uh, kind of a pictorial way of uh, you know how, how do we you know is there an easy way easy way to sort of con conceptualize graphically the zoo and that, that's that's kind of a hard question I mean uh, I don't I don't want to draw a picture of animals in cages and stuff like that you know but you know how how is it how does it work here and we've um, we've come up with with this sort of thing now is anybody uh, has, taken an ec economics course, you might, you know, might recognize this. But what, what I've shown here, there are two dimensions. Actually, it looks like 10 because of the divisions in the screen. But you know, try to differentiate what's on the slide from the sections of the screen. OK, there are two dimensions. One is social impact, and the other is profitability. Th those are the two, profitability or market success in a very general sense. Those are the two things that we're interested in. I mean, for one thing, we want our social enterprises to be in the northeast quadrant, right? So we've, this is helpful also. Let me explain. The efficiency frontier, what does that mean? That's, that's a line that distinguishes what's possible from what's not possible. So think about the technology that we have and the resources that we have available. What's the best you can do? with any given organization or venture, OK? The, the social efficiency frontier defines the boundary between the feasible and the infeasible. So if you think about this construct, it says to you, it should say to you, look, whatever I do, I want to be on that frontier, right? Because I'm, if, if I'm below the frontier, I can do better on one or more of these dimensions. And as long as I move in the northeast direction, getting closer to the frontier, I'm doing better, not only uh, in terms of social impact, but in terms of market success. So we want to be able to operate on that frontier. And I, I, I don't have time to tell you another story, but the, the management folks that, that write about these things, they talk about a concept called shared value. Have you ever heard of that? Read about that? Nobody reads the Harvard Business Review? Good, it's not that great. <laughs> but the concept of shared value is that it is, you know, Harvard Business School professors going around and saying, if you manage your business right, you're going to have a positive social impact and you're going to make more money. And they are right as long as you're below the curve and you're being inefficient. <laughs> They didn't like that when I said that. <laughs> However, you know, it's true. You want to do whatever you can do to get on that curve. Once you're on the curve, though, you've got trade-offs to make between social purpose and profitability. 
So um, this diagram gives us a way of thinking about the zoo, because we want to be in that northeast quadrant, you know, where we're, do, where we're positive on both dimensions. And then we've got to make some decisions to make, make some decisions. One is, if we're below the curve, yeah, it's clear, we want to do better. We want to try to get up to the curve. If that's another form, or we can do better within our existing form, we've got to make better use of our resources, because for, for what we're putting into it, we should be able to get on that curve where we have more social impact and, and more uh, profitability. Um, but then, uh, having done that, uh, we need to decide what's the balance that we want to achieve between social pur purpose and market success. And that means trade-offs. That means moving along the curve, and that would be a conscious decision. And some of these different forms that are being proposed, or the things that we're talking about as being social enterprises, are better at some things versus others. If you're talking about a social business, they're probably going to be pretty good at making money, and you're going to worry about how much social impact they're having. If you're talking about nonprofits, not so good at making money. Uh, and they, they can make profits, but they have to put them back into the, the mission. But they're probably going to be pretty high on, on social imp impact. So you, you know, you, if you're an entrepreneur, you kind of need to decide what it is to, uh, what, what's the balance that, you, that you're looking for, and then which form of social enterprise might best fit your particular uh, objectives. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to try to leave plenty of time for Terry here um, by just going through this. But let me show you what this diagram helps, helps you do. First of all, if we want to draw boundaries on what we want to call the social enterprise zoo, we've got to decide where those radial lines go. And, and one reasonable thing is to say, look, we know about nonprofits. We know about businesses. Let's take them out of the picture, or at least sustainable businesses that are just you know, finding ways to, to, to have uh, good you know, good social images, but they're really not different from social businesses. We could take those out of the picture and just say everything between those radial lines is a social enterprise. That would be a policy decision. That would be, you know, kind of a, a consensus research decision. <clears throat> I, don't, I haven't made that decision in my own mind. To me, the whole quadrant is some form of social enterprise. It includes nonprofits and includes businesses that are in that northeast sector. So I don't want businesses here that are losing money. <laughs> they don't want that either. Or are causing damage. And, and that's an interesting thing to think about, too, because we've got every corporation and its, uh, and its affiliate uh, having a corporate social responsibility program, right? So they do some social good, right? But if you ask the question, when you look at their whole operation, are they causing, you know, net social good, or are they causing some damage because you're not counting their manufacturing operation that's polluting all the rivers. Um, I don't, I don't want to put businesses in that northeast quadrant that aren't <clears throat> really socially responsible. But at least the diagram helps us think about how to define the social enterprise zoo. Where do we want those radials? Do we want them, you know, do we want them orthogonal, or do we want, uh, you know, a more of an angle and just focus on on some of these uh, different forms in between. Um, well, we can, we can think about some other things. We talked about this before. If, we're, if we consider an enterprise and, and we think that uh, for one reason or another it's way below the, social, the, uh, the uh, efficiency frontier, then we ought to do something about it um, to, to see whether that form can get us to the frontier or we need to use another form. Um, if we're on the frontier, we need to decide what the balance is between profitability and social impact that fits what we want to do as an organization. And it's perfectly legitimate. I mean, you know, Ben and Jerry's was a social enterprise. They, they made lots of money, but they also wanted to do various kinds of social good. And they had it clear in their mind that there was a trade off. And it wasn't going to be like a nonprofit, but it wasn't going to be like a, you know, a, a conventional business either. So that's a decision once you've once you're operating efficiently. <clears throat> then the other thing is, you know, and social entrepreneurs are always talking about that, we want to innovate. We want to do something different. Well, OK, maybe there's something different that you can actually do that will pull the frontier with you. OK, if you've got a really different way of solving a social problem, then maybe you can have more social impact than anything out there um, 
And in effect, what you're doing is saying, I've got a way to move that frontier. So the frontier, that is to say, all right, you know, <clears throat> the zoo's boundaries are too narrow. We want to pull them out a little bit because we can do, we can do more good because I've got an innovative way of putting together a venture or an organization. Um, and I, you know, we want to avoid those, those areas. So that's, this, I, this is sort of a framework for thinking about all the important questions that we need to face up as entrepreneurs, managers, researchers, policy makers, in terms of really getting a handle on, on this thing that we're calling uh, uh, social, social enterprise. Um, these are some of the policy things that we've talked about, but I want to give Terry plenty of time. I want to give very brief mention to an organization, Stuart Mandel is here, he's the executive director, and it's an organization that uh, I've been affiliated with uh, a long time, um, that actually tries to help nonprofits think through their resource-related decisions. And of course, social enterprises is one, so um, that's, uh, that's, that's a topic that, um, that this organization can, can contribute to as well. Um, but I will leave it there, and I'm very anxious, um, you know, to hear what, what Terry has to say because he's a quintessential um, social entrepreneur that runs a very uh, interesting and impactful social enterprise. So, Terry. I just wanted to say that we have uh, some flyers on the table over there for the National Center on Nonprofit Enterprise if you want to pick one up and, and see what they're about. I also realize, thank you for policing yourself, Dennis, because don't sit behind the speaker if you need to signal that they're going too long. <laughs> Fa fatal error on my part. So <laughs> thank you for self-policing. <laughs> and now Terry Davis. I, uh, I couldn't put my rear view mirror up. <laughs> well, good evening. I, I appreciate the fact that uh, you guys are here, and Dennis, thanks for the invite. What was this topic? Social, <laughs> what is that thing called? Social uh, enterprise, social enterprise, right? Well, Dennis gave the pretty much the macro view of it. I'm gonna bring it down uh, a little bit and talk more specifically about uh, what actually happens in a nonprofit and how we turned our agency around and, and went from uh, a nonprofit to, I think the model for us would be a hybrid. We're like right in there. We, we are a nonprofit, but we function like a for-profit in many, many ways. And I think in today's world, that's what you have to do. There's no way in the world uh, it, it can be like it was when I entered the field. Uh, just a little bit of back, background info on me. As, as you said, I'm from Cleveland. I graduated from East Tech. Uh, I was a baseball player. I had this big dream of going to Arizona. I got a scholarship to Arizona, went to play baseball. And uh, three months after I got to Arizona, I, I decided, you know what, I better figure out a different uh, way of making it out here because those guys in Arizona was a little bit too much for me. So the whole idea of nonprofit came for me in a, a pretty interesting way. I came back to Cleveland uh, uh, with a child. I was 19 years old. And I said, you know, uh, I'm fitting a stereotype that a lot of young men like myself fit. Uh, I'm not married, I have a kid, and uh, I'm not really sure where I'm gonna go. I, I took a job at a daycare center, which was in line with what I was going to school for, early childhood education. I was a teacher, taught toddlers, two-year-olds. Paid me $7.65 an hour. So it just so happened that I took a second job at a place called Rosemary Center in 1981. And Rosemary Center provided services to individuals with developmental disabilities. Back then they called them retarded people, retarded children who had no family, nowhere to go, you know, uh, never went outside, was locked away, put away, and hidden away. And that's what this society said even back then. Certainly before that, it was much worse. Those are the individuals that changed me. As a direct care worker, I was taught by a bunch of kids with disabilities what life is really about. 
and this whole nonprofit thing. Rosemary Center became and was a charity, a charitable organization that tried to solicit dollars in support of those individuals. It was an uphill climb all the way. Catholic Diocese ran the organization, nonprofit, but there's very little room for growth. I realized very quickly that these children who were toddlers to 12 years old was going to eventually grow up. And what was their life going to be? More institution? More institutional living? And that's when I decided that, hell no, I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to do something different, very different. I'm very unique. At 21 years old, I'm going to change. You can change the world. If you're in this nonprofit thing, you have to have a vision and you have to have a belief. And with that belief, you go after what you think is possible. And for me, it was endless possibilities, possibilities out there that never existed before. We lived in homes. Why couldn't they? They couldn't live in homes because when we tried to open a home in a community, the community fought us said, not here. We love what you're doing, but not in my backyard. I think you've all heard that before. So you become a fighter. You train that in order to change and in order to be successful, you have to make change. You have to go to the housing meetings and fight the fight. You have to go down to Columbus and fight the fight. Nonprofits have to do that. We're set up, guys. Understand this. We're set up to fail because there's never enough resources for what it is that we want to do. So in order to do that, we have to go out there and get them. We have to fight the system, and it's just outlined for you, rules, regulations, all the things that come with nonprofit organizations. And if you want your 501c3 from the federal government, you have to jump through a million hoops to get it. You have to jump through another million to keep it. And then you don't do anything with it. Well, I realized quickly that we were going to have to take that nonprofit status and turn it into something special and assist the federal government. We don't have to be receivers of everything. We could become a part of what the government is trying to do. And that's when this idea came to my mind that we have to change the mentality of what nonprofit means and what it is. We have to make some money, in other words. So we start being creative, raising money. We started out with goodwill type programs. Donate your clothes, donate your furniture. And we started with resale stores. Not one, I opened one, we got two, we got three, we got four, we got them. We have five stores throughout Northeast Ohio. And combined, all five of them made less than a million dollars. Well, when I took over our, uh, uh, our Lady of the Wayside in 1989 is when I actually came to the Wayside as a consultant to change what they were doing there. They were on the brink of receivership. I brought that mentality with me. But the ROI, the return on investment, wasn't good. Five resale stores, we're making less than a million dollars and working hard every day and had a $100,000 profit at the end. Didn't work. We need more resources. So then we created this thing, social enterprise, <laughs> called a car donation program. It was the first program in Ohio to, to, to bring it to this state. Car donation program. You donate your ride, we get it, we sell it, you get a tax deduction. But we weren't used car salesmen. We had a board of directors that didn't believe in that. I lost three board members over the fight and right to do something creative. Nonprofit risk. Where does that come into play? You find me a good nonprofit, and I'm going to tell you they believe in risk. Take in risk. There's always going to be a risk. There's a risk in for-profits. So we lost three board members over the right to
to create this thing called car donation program. Well, we got it. We replaced those board members and we moved on. Social enterprise. We start bringing in cars, selling them to the public, taking the profits, and start developing homes in the community for our consumers. When I got to Wayside, we had three homes. Three homes, all in Avon. We brought in the car donation program, start creating a lot of things, developing relationships with organizations, partnerships. We have a partnership with the Indians, with the Cavs, with a lot of foundations, with individuals. He wasn't joking about those million dollar con contributors. You know, when you get a $500,000 check from a person, you start believing that that can happen. No, let's back up. When you get a $500 check <laughs> from somebody, you start believing it can happen. And now we get $500,000 checks. We get million dollar contributions. But we didn't start like that. But we believed in what we were doing. Our mission was strong. So the car donation program is what changed everything for me and the thinking. What's out there and what the possibilities are. We had a tiny small car lot in Cleveland. First month we took in 15 cars. 15 cars, sold them all. Today, that was in 1997, 15 cars. First year, 700 cars. Today, we're approaching 100,000 cars that have been donated to Our Lady of the Wayside. 100,000 cars, $30 million. We are in one of the, <laughs> the generous, most generous communities around. But you got to want it. You have to believe in it, and you have to go after it. Social enterprise. We do events. You have some handouts there. We don't call fundraising, fundraising. We call it friend raising. Because for us, it's about bringing new participants into our program, introducing them to the world of developmental disabilities. Oh, back, I mentioned we had three homes in Avon. We have nearly 100 homes now in seven counties. 100 homes that we have developed for people. We had 65 staff when I got to Wayside. We have nearly 900 staff now. Don't tell me that you can't take a nonprofit and run it like a for-profit. No, you can't tell me that because you have to do it if you're going to be successful. Our budget, when I got to Wayside, was $900,000. And we had a $400,000 deficit. That's what I inherited, walking through the door. This year, our budget is $34 million. $34 million that we take, and as Dennis said, $34 million that we spend. Our goal is zero. Every dollar that comes into the agency as a nonprofit is put right back into the agency. It's put into our salaries for our employees. 87% of our budget is employees. People serving people. Social enterprise. <laughs> what is that really about? It's about taking a, th a theory and an idea and putting it to work and believing in it and nurturing it and developing it and getting results. When I came to Our Lady of the Wayside, they never went out. They had one vehicle for 70 individuals. We have 150 vehicles on the road every day taking these people to places they've never dreamed they could go before. I was told many times that it could never be done. 
It could never be done. Entrepreneur, no, how about the pioneer versus the settler? Do you know that story? What does pioneers do? They build the roads, they pave the way. The settlers want to sit and wait. They have no creativity. Do you know how many nonprofits open and close every single year? Because they have the dream, they have the vision, but they don't have the work ethic that goes along with it. They create a board of conservative individuals who are scared and fearful of taking risks. You want to be a nonprofit? You want to have a 501c3? Why? If you're not going to use it. We talked about a lot about rules and regulations. Don't let them deter you. If you want to be the best, the rules and regulations become minor standards, or what we like to call at Our Lady of the Wayside, minor obstacles that are out there that we have to get past. So this year, or actually in 2019, we received yet again another three-year certification standard for providing services. That is the gold standard in the state of Ohio. That's because there's tons of rules and regulations. Oh, by the way, 600 agencies that provide services to people with developmental disabilities closed last year. Decertify. Couldn't pass the rules. The rules are stringent, tough. But it doesn't have to deter you from your mission and doing what's necessary. If you want to be the best, go for it. If you want to be average, stay there. If you want to be a nonprofit and don't do any work, you're not going to exist. Think about all ideas, the great ideas. He just went over a, a handful. There were 10,000 service providers in our business in 2019. 6,500 of them no longer exist in 2020. It's hard. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of planning. There's a lot of rules. There's a lot of hoops to jump through. Social enterprise, that's when you and I get together, come up with an idea, and say, hey, we can do this. But we got to look at the rules. Aren't there rules for for-profit industries? I think so. We can't be deterred by rules. What's the next step? Where do we go from here? Here's what I would say to you as I try and wrap this little lecture up. When you take your nonprofit to the next level, you start thinking about things like this. We have a business here. What is it that we do that people really want from us? Our consumers became our customers. We said that we want to be the best provider around. Our consumers is our customers. What do you do with customers if you want them to come back? You serve them well. So we have children and adults with developmental disabilities doing things now that was never heard of before. They go on cruises, they have jobs, they have their own bank accounts, they have their own homes. You know, I had families telling me it'll never happen for their loved ones. <laughs> it can happen if you want to put in the time, effort, and work. Make whatever you're providing, make whatever you're providing your business. Be the best at it. The funding, creating opportunities, finding resources, partnerships, relationship building, all those things go hand in hand with it. We're rated as the number one 
agency providing services to this population under the waiver system in the state of Ohio now. That same agency that some 30 years ago was getting ready to have its doors closed. And now we can't serve enough people. They're lined up wanting us. And we have to say no. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you both for those uh, sharing those comments with us. Terry, I'm sad to report that I come from a long line of settlers. <laughs> <laughs> My family got to Louisville, Kentucky, and they saw the, uh, the rapids on the Ohio, and they said, this is far enough. <laughs> we'll set up shop here. <laughs> so we're going to have some, uh, we're interested to hear comments and questions from the audience, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the first one uh, just to get us rolling. Dennis, going back to the zoo. Um, there's animals I like in the zoo, and there's ones I don't like. Yeah. I like Terry. Terry's a koala. <laughs> I like traditional 501c3s that are doing profit-based mm -hmm. revenue generation. I also like for-profits that give away their profits to nonprofits, like those are my pandas. Mm -hmm. I don't like for-profits masquerading as nonprofits. Those are my hyenas. <laughs> Do we have a problem in the sector of what boils down to jealousy and fear of this new cadre of social enterprises that we need to get past? We fear the, the hyenas mm -hmm. and we forget about the other parts of the we're, fo we're overly focused on for-profits that are moving into social good as a threat rather than seeing the value of the total package. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. <laughs> um, there certainly are um, many people in the nonprofit sector that see this as a, as a threat uh, that don't you know fully appreciate the nuance of what's being talked about in terms of of social enterprise and uh, are concerned that um, they will be outcompeted in their markets for, with with a uh, for profit and and uh, you know uh, there there is some legitimacy to to those concerns because you know we have experience with various sectors where that kind of competition uh, takes place. We have for-profit nursing homes that are trying to compete with non-profit nursing homes. We have uh, we won't name any of them for-profit universities that are competing with non-profit universities, and in some instances. Um, they don't do a very good job, and, uh, and they cause some big problems. Um, but, I th you know, but I do think that that's probably too narrow a view in a couple of senses. First of all, um, there's real value in, in competition. People get better by accepting the competitive challenge and figuring out how to, how to deal with it and, and being successful. Um, and you know, I'm sure that if a for-profit comes into the area of services to uh, um, to develop many developmentally disabled people, that um, Terry would welcome the competition and probably run them run them out of the state. So, so there there's a there's a generic value in having competition. Um, but I, but I also think that we should leave some room to at least evaluate. This is a very new phenomenon of social businesses where people are trying to create a different sort of legal form that somehow provides a combination of, um, of straight market economic return and social impact. Um, and maybe has some potential for doing more than we can do within the existing array of vehicles that we have. Maybe it can attract more investments, people that 
you know, want to invest their funds. They want to make money on, on their investments, but they also want to feel good about what they're investing in. And if they have a vehicle where they can do that, maybe you can get more resources into the sector. Maybe we have, um, you know, idealistic young entrepreneurs that are very concerned about uh, making a good living. They're, they're not, you know, they're not saints. They, they don't want to, you know, feel that they have to sacrifice their own um, welfare in order to do social good. If they had a form that could compensate them, uh, you know, more than they might get through a nonprofit and still allow them to do what they want to do, you know, I think we should keep our minds open as to whether such forms can work and whether they would attract into areas like social services or, uh, you know, education or whatever, um, talent and resources that we haven't had before. And I don't think nonprofits should be should be afraid of that. You, you do have to worry about the predatory for-profits. There's no question about that. And if we can't create the legal forms and regulations that would keep you know, the zoo properly maintained and in bounds, then, then we shouldn't just go out and, and, and have a wild west. But uh, the world is more complicated than it was when we started looking at this simple three-sector model. And, and we should be open to these possibilities, I think. And it's early days. It's early days in the subject. I, I, I'll just add a, a couple of things to that. Um, I, I don't think there's a need to be fearful. I mean, there's always going to be a need for a safety net. Uh, uh, you know, we have to have uh, uh, resources and nonprofits and people who are going to tend to those who are less fortunate and those who don't have the ability to make it out here. Uh, but having said that, I think. Uh, um, uh, nonprofit status has to be taken more seriously. Uh, I think there's a lot of, um, uh, when you go to, to the Attorney General and you ask for that status, I think they used to throw them out like candy. You know, they give them to anybody. But the, the rules and just to even become a nonprofit has become much more stringent now. And it's a lot more difficult. And, and for me, I, I think that's a good thing for us. You know, um, if you're going to do it, you got to go all in with it. Because if you if you just continuously create nonprofits and there's no, you know there's a, a stretch and search for resources amongst all of us, and there's a lot of good out there. There's a lot of people doing a lot of good things beyond what our lady at the wayside doing. There's a lot of good social causes out there for nonprofits to entertain. But I do think if they're going to do it, we need to make sure that uh, the rules are set so that. Um, a commitment is there and that you have the ability to obtain the resources to get off the ground and and you put it up there maintain and so but I don't I don't I don't have any big concern about for profits from the standpoint of of competition because I take it like this you know we're gonna survive because no one's gonna outwork us just simple as that all right let's uh, let's see what Questions or comments we have from the audience? Anybody want to take a stab? Let me bring you. We've got two mics. We've got two, two right here. Questions. Hi. Um, so my question is: So you mentioned how like nonprofits are on their way down if they don't become social enterprises. Uh, will they continue to thrive even if they don't like convert into social enterprises into the future? Yeah, I, I don't think I said exactly that. I, I did say that nonprofits are threatened because some of their traditional uh, sources of revenue um, are uh, are at risk. Um, you know, we've had um, you know several rounds of conservative government government that, uh, that doesn't believe in, in uh, generous funding of of nonprofits and social services. So that that has been a an issue in many fields. Um, we've uh, partially, perhaps, due to the changes in the tax uh, laws, but for whatever reason, uh, giving at least in the short run has has leveled off. So. You know, I, I'm not necessarily saying that the nonprofits have to change their form, but they have to recognize, like like Terry does, that you got to go out there and 
make it work. And I think part of what it means to make it work is to, is, to, is to look more widely at what you can do and how you can generate resources in order to uh, continue to carry out your mission or to grow that mission. The but, I, a lot yeah, but we're going to see nonprofits. I, I don't think they're going away. Although there are people in the sector that are worried about it. I mean, I had just for, you know, I, I had an advisory committee at Georgia State, and and the head of the goodwill of Georgia State was uh, of the state of Georgia was, was was on that committee, and and he was just seriously worried about the for-profit sector coming in and you know competing his. His, uh, his sources of revenue away and, and didn't see what alternatives he had. So people think differently about it. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say that the, the tax laws are a big concern of mine, too. I think we, we, uh, we've seen a major change. I don't know, many of you may not recognize it, but uh, this last year, this past year, with these two new tax laws kicking in, um, um, most of our donors, for instance, lost their exemption, their ability to to use the long form even. <laughs> so, you know, for us, it was it, we haven't seen a, a huge downturn in contributions yet, but uh, we know that a lot of our donors uh, have made it clear. It's even for the car donation program, because basically now you're not the tax return for most of our donors is worthless. So. Uh, my question is actually on finances and funding. I know that social enterprises are attacking a very niche area within the spectrum of nonprofits and business and, and falling dead in the middle. Uh, the business side probably opens up funding opportunities such as loans, uh, whereas a nonprofit side probably attracts more donorship and grants. I wonder if you could speak more about the vast options for funding, as well as if there are some that are more highly recommended, depending on the type of social enterprise and its constitution, um, and some that are a lot less recommended. That's a fantastic question. It's also the subject of my other lecture. <laughs> <laughs> um, because you know the interesting thing about nonprofits is that they do have all of these different funding streams, right? I mean, and, and they're unique in, in that sense. I mean, they can attract donations, they can attract in-kind contributions, they can attract volunteers, they can attract government contracts, government grants, uh, they can sell things, uh, they can have members. It's just amazing. So if you look at the nonprofit sector and you say, well, you know, what's the right formula these days for, for funding a nonprofit? Um, the first thing that you got to realize is that there's no, there's no one answer. That it really, you have to figure out a way of what, uh, figure out how, what combination of revenue streams best fits your mission. And that, that involves several, several steps, but it goes all the way back to what is the mission, who are you benefiting, and how do those beneficiaries uh, translate into possible ways that they can support you? So um, you're, going to, you're going to see, justifiably, you're going to see a whole variety of uh, different income portfolios in the nonprofit sector. And they will be correlated with what any given organization is, is actually trying to do. Now, that can change over time, you know, especially when we have changes in policy. You know that make it a little bit more difficult, say, to tap into donations, or um, you know we may make a good argument for s services we're producing that benefit the whole society, but unfortunately we have a very conservative government that doesn't, that doesn't think that way. So things do change, but within within that framework, um, a nonprofit leader really has to think very carefully about how his or her. Um, revenue streams and income streams actually are a good match for what they're trying to achieve with their mission. That's the way I see it. We, that's it, it's called diversification. You, you might have a focus on, uh, on what you do well. For instance, we provide services to children and adults with developmental disabilities. But the federal government has about 20 different programs out there. I have 18 funding streams. We are certified 
for 14 different services under that spectrum. So we can't just do residential. We do transportation. We just can't do residential and transportation. We do day programs. We do respite. We do all the services so that, in other words, we follow the money. Wherever the money is, that's where you go. Now, again, that's outworking everybody else. When you develop your mission as this is all you want to do, just remember, you're locking yourself into that. And you're also locking yourself into the funding opportunities that go along with it. When you diversify and expand your services and program, you open the doors for a lot of other funding streams, a lot of other services. But again, who wants to work that hard? I only want to do this. Well, if you only want to do this, you're only going to get this. So where does our funding come from? I learned very quickly. Most of it is from the state, federal, and county governments. So what we decided to do was we got to do the business that they need. So we serve in our population, but we're serving them in many different ways. And each one of those have a funding stream attached to it. I didn't want to be in the transportation business, but that's where the money is. That's a $5 million program for me now. So creativity and generating resources be, is my number one priority. I have to pay the staff, and I have to find the resources that I need to make sure the consumers have what it is that they need. So you, you, you don't just talk about it, you have to generate it. You have to look it, just, just as Dennis said, you, you have, to, as the leader of the organization, you have to figure out where's the funding coming from. It just doesn't fall out of the trees. You gotta go get it. And, and Terry doesn't do that willy-nilly. It's not, it's not as if it's random because he's always thinking about, in, in, in fact, you know, things that you're already doing where there may be a constituency for supporting that you haven't even thought about. You know, you, you ha he has to do the transportation. He has to do all of these things in order to benefit in a holistic way the population that he's serving. But then you need to think about the next step in, in, in terms of where support can come for those ancillary services that are really are part of your mission broadly defined. That's, that's your strategic planning. That's what we call it. And every year, we, we have a strategic plan for the next year. We used to do five-year plans. We, we can't look out five years from now with this government and what's going on. And so we don't want to be controlled by the government, so we reduce the number of years we look out into the future and start focusing on a two- to three-year plan and then broke that down to a one-year plan. So we know what we're going to do this year for certain, and we are talking about the things that we need to do the following year. So it's the strategic thinking constantly that's going on. Our, our strategic plan never ends. It's a running plan that continuously happens each year. No, each six months. No, each month. You're always looking at, to the next step and trying to stay ahead of what's coming. Well, we, we are at time, and uh, I want uh, to ask you to join me in, again, thanking uh, Dennis and Terry. Thank you.